Thanks for sticking around. Nigeria's ranking remains unchanged at number 136 on the Global Corruption Perception Index ranking of the Transparency International. The agency's new report released today shows Nigeria loses one point on the list of TI parameters of how corruption is perceived around the world. The most corrupt countries in the world, according to the report, are Angola, South Sudan, Sudan, Afghanistan, North Korea, and Somalia. For Sub-Saharan Africa, the TI report says the region was the hardest hit, with 40 countries out of 46 suffering from corruption. However, the London-based organization listed the United Kingdom, Senegal, and Greece as the top three in terms of improvement in anti-corrupt practices. Now let's get back to the central bank's decision making around the world. We're sticking with Nigeria. The Monetary Policy Committee of the Central Bank yesterday retained the benchmark interest rate at 11%. The Apex Bank also held the cash reserve ratio for commercial banks at 20%. Let's take a listen briefly to what Godwin Mefele uh, said. The committee noted the ongoing activities in the informal segments of the foreign exchange market which led to the stoppage of, the, of dollar sales to the broad exchange segments, even as the average Naira exchange rate remained relatively stable at the interbank segment during the period under review. The exchange rate at the interbank market opened at 197 Naira to the dollar and closed at 197 Naira with a daily average of 196 Naira 99 cobo to the dollar between November 23 and January 11, 2015. All right, let's go to London now, to Alan Cameron, who is the chief economist at Exotic Partners, to talk to us through this uh, decision-making, the first in 2016 by Nigeria's uh, central bank. Alan, a good afternoon to you. We appreciate your time. Good afternoon. Thank you. Were you disappointed with the no devaluation decision yesterday by Nigeria's central bank? Um, I think the consensus has probably shifted in you know the couple weeks before the decision. I, I don't think it was a huge surprise. I mean, we had some commentary coming from the finance ministry, some from the VP, and obviously from the central bank itself, which um, you know caused the ground to shift a little bit. Um, so yeah, I, I think. You know, it was disappointing, but it not not a total surprise. And I think the main takeaway from that meeting is that yes, currency reform is going to take place. Um, just probably not in the way that I expected, and that you know some of the foreign investors looking at the situation expected. Yes, exactly, precisely, Alan. What are foreign investors looking for in Nigeria's market monetary policy? What are they looking for? Well, the problem with the current situation as it exists right now is that they can buy into the market. They can buy Naira for 199 But the problem with that system is that those, um, those dollars are then given to importers in a subsidy that's just not very transparent. So whereas the average Nigerian or the average corporate needs to purchase dollars of 300 um, some of them are getting it at 197 And there's just no transparency on who exactly is, is getting you know, those dollars at a subsidized rate and why. And now foreign investors are being asked to pay into the system, which, um, you know, doesn't really sound like a good deal, especially when, you know, the very widespread consensus is that the fair value for the Naira is, you know, not all that close to 200 anymore. In your analysis uh, as an economist, how soon do you think Nigeria's Reserve Bank would have to do something about the FX and interest rate? Well, it's difficult to say. There's a lot of moving parts. Clearly, there's an increasing amount of pressure on the central bank to do something. There's a very widespread expectation that, you know, some kind of action is required. Um, but to answer your question, I don't think they're about to run out of reserves next month. Um, you know, depending on how you measure imports, they have somewhere between four to five months of import cover. So it's not a balance of payments and prices, but they are continuing to lose reserves. So what's clear to most people is they can't just keep doing what they're doing. Now, even with the, with the demand management measures that we've seen, those are not sufficient to stop the bleed of reserves when the oil price is below $30. So something will need to happen. Um, how soon that happens is really, it's a matter of political economy rather than traditional economics at this point. Um, and I think, you know, ultimately it will require the okay from the presidency um, because it very much looks like they're calling the shots right now as opposed to the central bank. 
Uh, okay, Alan, we're going to have this conversation again. Of course, we're going to talk between now and the next 60 days where the central bank will hold its second MPC meeting in 2016. That will be sometime in the third week of March, isn't it? Uh, yes. It yes, should that should be about, that's about, about, about time. So let's, let's hang it in there till then, shall we? Okay, sounds good. <laughs> Thank you, Alan Cameron, a chief economist at Exotic Partners in London. Now let's stick with the continent, Africa, where Uganda, East Africa, is expanding its middle class, giving rise to a coffee drinking culture that has seen urban coffee houses grow in the country. Uganda grows some of the world's best coffee, but consumes about just 3%. Most of that is exported to the European Union and the United States, among other countries. Uganda recently had its ninth Baristas Championship, an annual contest meant to promote the country's coffee and unveil the brewer with the best coffee-making skills. Sixteen people took part in the championship, which required them to prepare espressos, cappuccinos, and original beverages for four judges within 15 minutes. You fancy cappuccino? Let's have a test. At Barita contests, judges often look for a thick elastic espresso, a cappuccino topped with high caliber foam texture and a unique coffee invention to please the eyes and taste buds. In the end, Dennis Agaba won the 2015 title. A new culture found around coffee drinking has seen various chains open cafes in Uganda as well as Kenya, Nigeria and Rwanda as the shops become popular meeting venues for a growing middle class. I appreciate coffee in a way I never thought possible. You've got different coffee beans, that's what I've come to discover, and the creativity from the contestants. It's not just the normal coffee whereby you just go get coffee beans and just drink. They have taught me that you can actually mix up the coffees with one of your favorite ingredients and you actually get something that you actually really love. Uganda is a, a small consumer of coffee. We export a lot of coffee, but we consume little coffee. So this is one of the uh, activities we do to actually, actually encourage the consumption of coffee in Uganda. Because I think we, uh, Uganda consumes only about 2% of what they produce. So we want actually Uganda to become the first consumers of the coffee that they produce. Many Ugandans have always preferred tea instead in the former British colony. Despite growing some of the world's best coffee, consumption remains low as most of the produce is exported. Africa's biggest exporter and the eighth biggest exporter globally has about 500,000 small farmers grow coffee. It's Uganda's biggest commodity export, accounting for up to 30% of the country's foreign exchange earnings. Africa's largest producer, Ethiopia, which is also said to be the birthplace of coffee, drinks up half of its 330,000 tons annual production because the population has traditionally enjoyed the brew. Coffee is big business in East Africa, which produces some of the world's finest Arabica and Robusta beans. Farmers are being encouraged to grow more coffee in the country and capitalize on leading exports to increase their income further. Almost every building in Kampala is having a coffee shop. And uh, that compared with what was happening five years ago is uh, 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 a plus for the country. We are literally saying the country is in the right direction and I believe in the next 10 years uh, Uganda coffee consumption will be very competitive in uh, this part of the world, especially in the East African region. The continent has sold commodities that are processed and consumed in industrialized nations, such as cocoa for chocolate or beans for espressos, while Africans get a fraction of the profits. That's a new coffee drinking community in Africa, East Africa there, and that's expanding, expanding rapidly across the continent. Let's come back after the break. We'll talk about the state of the economy for sub-Saharan Africa. We have a lot for you about the latest sales managers index from World Economics. Let's get back to you with that. I right, will get to the final lap of the program. The latest uh, sales managers index data from the world economics has signaled a further easing in the rate of growth of the African economy. 
with both sales and market growth rising at the weakest rate since July 2015. The World Economic Headline Sales Managers Index for Africa fell from 59.5 reading in December to 58.7 in January 2016, reaching a 10-month low. I'm now being joined by the Chief Economist at the World Economics in London this lunchtime. Brian Stargis is joining us via Skype. Brian, it's good to see you again. Good to see you. Good to see you in London. How is it doing today? You drinking coffee? Uh, I, I actually prefer tea, to be honest, but um, I do like a bit of coffee in the morning sometimes, and you? <laughs> I, I, I like coffee. We're at about 22 degrees centigrade here in Lagos today. It's a little bit mild, so I've had one large one in the morning a couple of hours ago, but I can still do with another. Yeah, well, it's, uh, the, the weather is not very nice here, as usual in Britain. Yeah, we understand. <laughs> it's all about snow and cold weather. This winter is so, this uh, winter is something else in 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 northern hemisphere, western hemisphere, all of you. Yeah, I think I'd rather be in Lagos. Yeah, you'd rather be in Lagos, but you'd look like someone dressed to be in Lagos. You don't dress like someone in the in the cold. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Brian, talk to us about Pan African economy. Despite this uh, slowdown in sales managers index, economic activities by sales managers. Looks like Nigeria is still at top of the, of the table, uh, looking at South Africa, Egypt, and Algeria, those four countries you cover regularly for, uh, for the world to see. Well, it's uh, obviously the headline figure for the continent is taking an, an, an average of all sorts of things happening. Um, and uh, you know, the, the, the picture is very, very, very different across the different, um, different countries. Um, South Africa picking up very, very slightly. Um, Algeria going down quite strongly. We've now actually started to do um, figures for, for Kenya, you know, the smaller economy, and Ken, Kenya is showing growth. But Nigeria, of course, is still suffering from the, uh, the low oil prices. Okay, put this together for us. Uh, what does this tell us about how Africa is being affected by what goes on out there in the world, the global headwinds? Well, unfortunately, Africa does tend to catch colds because the, um, you know, because with the commodity price slowdown, with the slowdown of the growth of China, that's, that's impacted on, on Africa very badly. And also the, the point which was brought up uh, a bit earlier on the program is that when you have, a, a, say, a change in consumption patterns, or even if you actually have things like coffee being being um, drunk in Europe as a part of Africa, the producer doesn't get very much out of it. Africa still needs to actually get more value-added products out there into the market. Mm, so, so you think we should do it? Uh, if we do a lot more of beneficiation of cocoa in West Africa, coffee in East Africa, you think we can get a lot more? Part of the global trade, and we could get a lot more from the sales managers in there. We could get things better. Yeah, but not 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 just selling is actually commodity, but actually selling is brands. Ah, uh, yeah. Uh, okay. Okay, let's uh, let's leave it at that. We'll, we'll come to you in the next uh, couple of days. We're looking at the data from Kenya. That's one country we would like to hear from you folks at World Economics. What do you have to say about is uh, uh, sales managers index and the state of that economy? Okay, well, we're just looking at Kenya, so we'll, we'll talk to you then. Yes, we need to okay. talk about that. Nigeria's president is there right now as we speak. Thank you very much, Brian Stargis. Grab a cup of coffee, get into, onto the plane, and come to Lagos if you can. Brian Stargis, Chief Economist at World Economics in London via Skype. China's Statistics Bureau says there was no basis for yuan depreciation given China's solid economic fundamentals. According to him, a sustained depreciation of the yuan exchange rate could fuel capital outflows. He, however, reiterated the Chinese government's confidence in the country's stock market and that the impact from the stock market volatility on the economy could be limited. But that's about all for today. Thanks for watching Business Incorporated. I am Bosun Mofa here in Lagos. I will see you next time. Do have a great day ahead.